We can't talk about ocean chemistry without talking about bubbles and foam. So let's look at how they're actually formed and how some animals can actually use them as a weapon. Yep, I'm afraid you heard right. We're talking about weaponizing bubbles and foam. Bubbles are essentially a gas pocket within a liquid, and many organisms produce bubbles through biochemical reactions or even through physical mechanisms. The gas in bubbles can be just about anything. Most commonly, it's the air, which is made of nitrogen, oxygen, and a host of other gases. Now, some organisms, like some kinds of bacteria, produce methane, and sometimes you can see small little bubbles trickling up from a lake bed or a seafloor. Now when bubbles make it to the surface of water, they require a film in order to survive for any length of time. And these thin films are usually made of the same constituents as seawater. These films will contain carbohydrates, proteins, fats, and dissolved organic matter in addition to water itself. And it's the mix of these ingredients that will dictate how long the bubbles will last. Now, once we're able to produce bubbles, it's often possible to accumulate and coalesce those bubbles in the form of foam, and it turns out that this process is more effective in seawater than in freshwater. In the ocean, this is what we call sea foam. And once again, to produce long-lasting sea foam, we need a variety of ingredients. And in seawater, carbohydrates are very effective at this and in coastal areas, we have kelp, among other seaweeds, that produce an abundance of carbohydrates. Now, in the surf zone, this foam is particularly visible in the splash zone, and sometimes even on the beach. And sometimes you can see piles of this stuff, especially on a windy day, accumulating on the beach. Now, in slow motion clips of ocean splash, you can appreciate the complicated foam structures that are created from the impact of a wave with the beach, with the rocks, the sand particles, and even with other splash structures. Some of these foam sculptures resemble whipped cream and can acquire remarkable shapes. The stiffness of the foam will depend on several things. The density of the seawater, which depends on what's in it, the constituents and the ions that are in that foam. It depends on salinity, the viscosity of the ocean water, and that's related to the thickness or stickiness and the resistance to flow of the actual seawater. It's also related to temperature, and finally surface tension, and the surface tension is what holds some of those structures in place. All of these things have to come together at just the right amounts to create these amazing shapes too much temperature and the bubble will evaporate too quickly. Too much temperature and you also lower the viscosity or the thickness of that seawater, which makes it more runny and the soapy films will not hold up. It's generally well understood that as bubbles rise in the water column, they grow. This is due to the reduction in water pressure as they come to the surface. The same thing happens when you open a can of soda. The dissolved gas will come out of solution in the form of tiny bubbles. Low pressure can also form around objects that move very quickly in water. When this happens, bubbles can come out of solution momentarily, and as soon as the normal pressure conditions resume, then the bubbles will collapse or cavitate. And in the process of cavitation, a shock wave occurs. This phenomenon happens with propeller blades in ships, and the constant cavitation can erode the surface of these propeller blades. In animals, this also happens. For example, when a dolphin suddenly darts and picks up speed, they can sometimes feel the painful cavitation shockwave on their flippers. Finally, cavitation is also a coastal erosion mechanism where quick pressure changes within the cracks of rocks are subject to the shock waves of imploding bubbles. It's pretty amazing, this cavitation phenomenon. 
Okay, so we did mention how some organisms are able to weaponize bubbles. Let's take a look at exactly how they do that. Here are a couple of examples. Humpback whales will blow columns of bubbles resembling cylinders to surround schools of fish. These are also called bubble nets. Vocalizations can also be involved as whales create noise outside the bubble net, but it's quiet within, so the bubbles have sort of created a buffer zone. The acoustic noise outside the ring is too much for the fish to withstand, which keeps them trapped for whales to swallow them up. In addition, bubbles can oscillate or vibrate, and this vibration produces sound. And it's possible that fish also become confused with the sound of bubbles. Dolphins are another species that use bubble nets for feeding. Another mechanism of cavitation that is used by certain marine organisms is the way pistol shrimp take advantage of this principle to stun or kill their prey. The fast snapping of their claw can generate not only a loud sound or click, but a shockwave from a collapsing burst of bubbles that will instantly kill its prey. The mantis shrimp is another animal that uses cavitation to stun and feed on its prey. Eventually our little bubbles are going to pop, and this happens when the film becomes thin enough through evaporation. And when the bubbles burst, something else happens. The crater-like shape will collapse and shoot a jet of water into the air. And this little jet can turn into even tinier droplets the size of aerosols known as sea spray. And finally, this remarkable thing about sea spray is that it can get caught up in the wind and travel inland hundreds of miles. And that means that plankton or whatever else is caught up in that aerosol can also travel on shore. It's pretty remarkable. As you can see, there's a whole lot to learn about bubbles and sea foam, and they play a really important role in ocean life and the marine environment. Music